Well, I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1, I remind you that this is the word of the living God, and so let us give our attention to its reading. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate, and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah, and the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you are in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray and ask God's blessing on our study tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that we are able to gather together at the close of this day to hear your word read and to hear it now proclaimed. We pray, O oh God, that you would give us attention to your word, that as we study it, as we hear it proclaimed, that would indeed have its, its impact upon our lives, upon our hearts, upon our minds. Cause us to think your thoughts after you. Cause us to love those things which you love. Cause us, O oh Lord, to walk in your truth, that we might bring glory to your name. All of this we ask that you would do by your spirit and through your son, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, beloved, we come together tonight to begin a new series through the book of Daniel. You're likely familiar enough with this book through various means, whether it's reading together as a family, perhaps through VBS curriculum, or just being fascinated by the stories that are given in the opening chapters of this book. Oftentimes, as you've heard me say before, it's very easy to turn biblical characters into heroes, superheroes even. And it's true that Daniel and his friends were amazing, heroic even. While the song Dare to be a Daniel isn't in our hymnal, and someone said amen, <laughs> reading these chapters, you understand why such a song was written. It's further true that these words were written 
as a way of encouraging God's people. And then we know that because at the end of Hebrews chapter 11, that great hall of faith, we read beginning in verse 32, And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets of whom Daniel is one, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Indeed, the author of Hebrews would go on to speak of them as, as those of whom the world was not worthy. Daniel and his friends are portrayed as models of faithfulness and obedience in the midst of the exile. They were tested, proved through various trials. As Solomon teaches us in Proverbs 17 in verse 3, the crucible is for silver and the furnace is for gold, but the Lord tests hearts. The book of Daniel, then, is a captivating narrative that unfolds over the course of six chapters of historical accounts and six chapters of prophetic visions. It is set against the backdrop of the Babylonian exile during which the people of Judah were taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar. The first six chapters are straightforward. It will likely take them one at a time, one each week. The latter half of the book consists of prophetic visions and apocalyptic imagery in which Daniel receives divine revelations about future events and the ultimate triumph of God's kingdom. These chapters are likely to take us a bit longer to work through. But while Daniel and his mighty band are heroic, they don't point to themselves. That's sort of the, the problem with, with, with only focusing on their heroism. They are not, in fact, the heroes of the story. Throughout the book, the central themes of God's sovereignty of his providence, of his faithfulness. They are woven together, highlighting God's control over history and his faithfulness to his covenant promises. That their faith persists and that they are delivered are clearly the work of the faithfulness of their God, of our God. For the end of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, in 586 B.C. was not the end of the story. It couldn't be. God had chosen Abraham and his descendants for something greater than a nation in the Middle East with a temple. Remember that the promise to Abraham extended even further. And God says, I will make of you a great nation and I will bless your name. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This was about a promise, God's promise, to save his people from sin and death. It is ultimately about the gospel, as the Apostle Paul tells us in Galatians 3.8, where we read that the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. Now at this point in the timeline, that is, in the book of Daniel, this has not taken place yet. And so this couldn't be the end. God isn't taking risks or placing bets on particular peoples and places. No, he is working his plan. This is something we've considered at length in our study of the Gospel of John, and particularly as we come to the end of Jesus' earthly life. But even if we were to back it up and take it even to the beginning of Jesus' life, we read in Galatians 4, 4 and 5, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. The fullness of time. Well, as we see clearly in our chapter this evening, it's not yet the fullness of time. No, Daniel and his friends have been dragged away into exile. There is only the promise of a Messiah. And from exile in Babylon, that promise seems so far away, even though it is closer to them than it was to Abraham. As I said, a few weeks ago, we are starting our series in this book in order to follow Israel through the exile. 
the devastation of the city of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple would surely have left them with many questions. Psalm 13 says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And the questions that would come up is, where's God? Has he forgotten them? Does he care? Daniel and his friends serve as a reminder of God's faithfulness and of the fact that the story goes on. God controls the movements of kings and nations. The power of worldly kings and nations is not greater than God's promises. This is the message to us. It is not without reason that the New Testament speaks of believers as elect exiles. Now, we are not in exile the same way that Israel was in exile as a penalty for breaking the covenant. We are in exile the way faithful Israelites were themselves in exile. We live in a sinful and fallen world. We are strangers and aliens here, pilgrims. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are not of this world. The question then facing Daniel and his friends about God's presence and faithfulness are important questions for us. The truth is, when we focus on the suffering of God's people, it is easy to question and doubt our faith in a sovereign God who loves his people. Well, our first chapter before us tonight dives right into these questions and provides us, or begins to provide us, with very good answers. Nothing is happening that is outside of God's control or God's use. Daniel 1, then, is written to comfort God's people with a very clear message that the sovereign Lord will faithfully guide his people in this world. The sovereign Lord will faithfully guide his people in this world. In this way, a second purpose emerges from this chapter, to encourage God's people to remain faithful to God. I like the way that Peter put it in our responsive reading, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. Now in this first chapter, what becomes clear is regardless of the circumstances that are being faced, God is the one who is acting. The Lord is the one who sends them into exile the Lord is the one who preserves them through the exile. And the Lord is the one who promises a future after the exile. These are our three points, and let's turn to them now. The Lord sends them into exile. It begins here in Daniel chapter 1, in the opening verses, recounting for us things which we know. If you've been part of our evening worship over these past months, and as we've worked our way through the end of Second Kings, as we've worked our way through lamentations over the past five or so weeks. We read here, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, was one of the greatest monarchs of ancient times. He began a world conquest that brought him to the gates of Jerusalem and through the gates of Jerusalem as he besieged the city, destroyed it, carted away the people and tore down and burned down the temple, the palaces, and so on. But notice the key in verse 2. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. It was God who gave. God was not asleep, but was in full command of the situation. This is something that is underscored by the term that Daniel chooses to refer to the Lord. It, it's not Yahweh, it's not the covenant God, but rather Adonai, which means owner, ruler, or sovereign. Moreover, the statement that the Lord gave shows clearly that it was not Nebuchadnezzar's military might or brilliance that brought about the downfall of Jerusalem, but it was the sovereign will of God. However, it might have been reported in the local Babylonian news. The Lord is the one who had done it. This is something that will confront Nebuchadnezzar several times in these opening chapters. He himself will be confronted with the reality of who God is. And notice also here in verse 2, the vessels from the house of God were taken. Matthew Henry notes, he says, See the righteousness of God. His people had brought the images of other gods into his temple. And now he suffers the vessels of the temple to be carried into the treasuries 
of those other gods. No further interest as we open our study tonight is the place which all of these things are brought to Shinar. Now, if you're familiar with your, not your biblical geography, but just your biblical history, that place should seem somewhat familiar. You may not know exactly where you heard it for, from before, but it's an echo, a reminder of the people who, in defiance of God, settled in the land of Shinar in Genesis 11 and verse 2 and built the Tower of Babel. This echo of the Babel narrative tips us off that Babylon is a place that is opposed to God and opposed to God's kingdom. In a sense, what this does is it sort of ratchets up the intensity of the moment. This is where they were carted off into exile, not into one of the other nations around them with whom they'd had relations in the past. They were not taken away by the Moabites, by the Ammonites, or even by the Philistines. No, this was Babylon. This was Babylon. This is where they gathered together to build a tower to heaven in defiance of everything that God had commanded. And so the defiance continues as the king of Babylon believes himself to be a god. It is here in Babylon where Daniel and his friends are taken. It is here where the Lord's providence is so clearly shown So in control of the moment is God that he sent a letter to the exiles by the hand of Jeremiah the prophet. In Jeremiah 29, verses 4 to 7, and he tells them to live in Babylon, to seek the welfare of Babylon. He says, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. The call then is faithfulness in the midst of exile, trusting in God's goodness and God's redemptive plan. But what a challenge. What a challenge it would be to all of those who were carted away. What a challenge it would be to Daniel and his friends in the king's court. What a challenge it is to you and to me when we live in a world that is full of sin that impacts us in every way and every day. And yet, in this we find good hope. This connection that we have to those Babylonian exiles, we find good hope. We could say more, but we must press on. There in verse 3, we see Nebuchadnezzar's command to Ashpenaz, the chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, some of the royal family, some of the nobility, young people without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and so on. And what is the purpose? To teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. Now this was a common way of bringing people into exile for Babylon. They didn't just slaughter everybody. No, they would take some of the brightest nobility and put them in places of prominence. Undoubtedly, this this, this, this would accomplish several things. On the one hand, it would allow Nebuchadnezzar to benefit from their service. After all, if there were those in those nations that had wise people, bright young people that could be raised up and useful to Babylon, then why wouldn't he take advantage of that? But it also gave perhaps hope to the rest of the people that they would see themselves as part of Babylon now. After all, their nobility, their young people, those whom they would see on the streets, they were now sitting in the palace. And perhaps you might have a little more of a cynical bent. You might think they're they're being held hostage and there are some commentators who spoke that way. The people dare not rise up against the king of Babylon because the nobility, the young people whom they admire, they are there and they would be the first to lose their heads. But notice further the course that Nebuchadnezzar puts them through. They to be given a daily portion of food that the king ate and wine that he drank. This wasn't to be the common food that everybody ate. No, they were given special food. They were further educated for three years when they would stand before the king. Now the food, most likely, if we understand the history of, uh, of the ancient Near East rightly, the food would have come from daily sacrifices. 
animals being taken to the various temples, slaughtered and offered up to the various gods, and then the choicest portions being brought back to the king for him to eat, for all of his servants to eat. The same would be true for the wine as well. It's not that the king wanted to pamper these boys. Undoubtedly, he wished to wean them away from how they had been raised and attach them to himself. As one commentator put it, they had to become Babylonians even in their eating and drinking. They had to be Babylonians in every moment of their existence. And this will create the first concern for the exiles. Speaking of the exiles, we see how God preserves them. Note first who are sent, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, names that are familiar to us, particularly the last three is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel means, God is my judge. But Belteshazzar, his new name, it means, may Baal protect his life. Hananiah means, God is gracious. Shadrach has connection to the Babylonian moon god. Mishael means who is like God. Meshach is from the god Marduk. Azariah means the Lord is my helper. Abednego means servant of Nabu, who was the patron god of wisdom and literacy. Do you see the way in which he has changed their names away from reminders of the faithfulness of their god to his gods? Surely at the center of this then is a question of worship and faith. And those are the questions that are going to drive us through these opening chapters of Daniel. Worship and faith. Daniel and his friends were put with the chief eunuch, which means they were likely made eunuchs themselves. And we can't be dogmatic on that point. But it was common for the high officials in Babylon, in, in Babylon to be made eunuchs. The idea, idea being that they would a, have access to the king's court which included his harem, his many wives, and concubines. But notice, as they are being given food, as they are being treated in this way, they stood by their convictions. Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or the wine that he drank. He asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. Now, while the request begins just as Daniel's, it will include the others by the end. Now some read this as, as Daniel identifying with his people who would not have had access to the king's delicacies. But the word that he has chosen here is important. Defile. People who defile themselves became unclean. They were no longer allowed into God's holy presence. Two ways the food would possibly defile. The first is that it was actually forbidden food. Think pork and shrimp and so on. The second reason is that it might have been offered up for worship. This was common, a common way for the nobility, as I've already said, to get their meat. This is true even of the Israelites. But this goes back to the very uh, uh, the ceremonial laws that God laid out for his people in Leviticus. Levit Leviticus 11, verses 45 to 47, we read, For I am the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. This is the law about beast and bird and every living creature that moves through the waters and every creature that swarms on the ground to make a distinction between the unclean and the clean and between the living creature that may be eaten and the living creature that may not be eaten. And this becomes one of, the, one of the primary ways in which Israel is separated from the nations around them. And yet here they are in the midst of Babylon. What would they do? Would they give in? Would they eat those delicacies that were given to them? Or would they take their stand? Daniel shows his endurance. He did not depart from the fear of God, nor become a stranger to his people, but he always retains his faith and remains a sincere worshiper of God wherever he is. And notice what happens. The Lord grants Daniel favor. In verse 9, God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. Now it might seem odd to say that, and then immediately what follows up is that Daniel's request is denied. He went to the chief eunuch and said that he asked not to defile himself. But what does the chief eunuch say? I fear my lord the king 
who assigned your food and your drink, for why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. The fear of Nebuchadnezzar was the major factor. This makes sense given that willful disobedience to the king would mean certain death. That's why he says, you would endanger my head with the king. Now, some want to read that as saying, my position, I'm the chief of the eunuchs. But I rather think he means his head, literally. But notice what his fear is. His fear is that their lack of nutrition would show. But notice the controlling point. For even before we get to the denial, we are told that God gave, gave favor and compassion to Daniel before the chief eunuch. These are words that we're familiar with. That, that word for, for uh, um, favor is the word chesed. It's that loving kindness. It's that covenantal faithfulness that God shows to his people. Now, that's amazing because it means that as Daniel and his friends have been dragged out of Jerusalem, as Jerusalem has been laid bare, the temple has been destroyed, God's covenant faithfulness remains. And it has followed them into exile. The word for compassion refers to God's compassionate and merciful nature toward his people. It signifies his deep abiding love and his willingness to show grace and forgiveness. Indeed, this favor and compassion spoken of here highlights important things in the context of this exile and Daniel and his friends. It underscores God's providential care for Daniel. Despite being in a foreign land and facing potential opposition, indeed actual opposition, God orchestrates events to ensure that Daniel finds favor with the chief eunuch. It highlights God's sovereignty over human affairs and his ability to work through individuals to accomplish his purposes. But even more, by receiving favor and compassion from the chief eunuch, Daniel would be granted ultimately permission to abstain from the king's food without facing repercussions, at least for a time. This demonstrates God's protection over his faithful servants and his provision for their needs, even in challenging circumstances. It's a testimony to God's character. God is good. God is faithful. And he stamps that upon this moment in redemptive history. The experiences that Daniel and his friends would go through would stand as a testimony, not to their heroism or bravery, as brave as they would be, but rather to God's faithfulness and his goodness that would follow them forever. Well, turning back to our text, we see that Daniel gives a proposal. He says to the steward of the chief of the eunuchs, he's talking now to the next level. He says, test your servants for 10 days. Let there be given us vegetables to eat and water to drink. And let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. Now, first of all, the fact that Daniel proposes this test is actually quite bold and amazing. He was a captive. He was dragged away from his homeland. He was not in a position to make demands, even if he was being trained in the king's court as former nobility, to be a wise man within the king's court. But there he is, boldly, making his request and leaving it completely in God's hands. And we see that he received favor. That favor that was given to him with regard to the chief eunuch trickles down then, if you will, to even the steward of the chief eunuch. He listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. Now make no mistake, this is not, as one author put it, the Daniel fast for weight loss, a biblical approach to losing weight and keeping it off. In my notes, I write, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is supernatural. It wasn't about somehow slimming down for the king's court. No, the appearance was to be fatter in flesh. That's the way they could see that they were not being robbed of nutrients. 
The Lord gave the king of Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon. The Lord gave Daniel the favor of the, of the chief eunuch. And so, of course, God gave Daniel and his friends supernatural sustaining so that they, in only 10 days, looked better nourished than the other young men. Here we see the way that God cares for his people, the way that he cared for Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the way in which he showed them his favor. John Calvin comments here, he says, it often happens that we cannot discharge everything which God requires and exacts without imminent danger to our lives. Sloth and softness naturally creep over us and induce us to reject the cross. You see, it would have been easy for Daniel to simply say, when in the king's palace, eat the king's food. No, Daniel gives us courage, Calvin writes, to obey God and his commands. And here states his favor with the prefect, since God granted his servant favor while faithfully performing his duty. Hence, he says, let us learn to cast our care upon God when worldly terror oppresses us, or when men forbid us with threats to obey God's commands. Here, let us acknowledge the power of God's hand to turn the hearts of those who rage against us and to free us from all danger. I was thinking also of the New Testament, the way in which the apostles faced a great deal of opposition for proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in Acts chapter 4, when Peter is dragged in and they're going to beat him for proclaiming Christ, they charge him not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But they answered, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. They cast their cares upon the Lord, even as Daniel and his friends did here. We see how the Lord sent them into exile and the Lord preserves them through exile. But lastly, we see the Lord's promise of a future after the exile. And it begins again in verse 17 with, with, with God giving them something. This has been very clear throughout the text. It is not about Daniel and his friends. It is about God and his faithfulness. God gave them learning and skill in all wit, literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. It wasn't about the opportunities afforded to Daniel and his friends. It wasn't about their own intellect. God gave them learning and skill. Now, I don't want to deny the fact that they were undoubtedly bright young men. That's why they had been brought into exile. That's why they'd been placed in the king's court. So we don't have to say it's all one or the other, but rather the Lord working through both natural and supernatural means provided for them. As we've seen already, God gave Judah into the hand of Babylon. God gave Daniel favor and compassion. God gave knowledge and skill and so on. The story is about the triumph of God, not through ordinary manifestations of power, but through God's manifold giving, even amid suffering, even amid signs of powerlessness, even amid the threat of death. Matthew Henry writes, he says, the interest which we, which we think we make for ourselves, we must acknowledge to be God's gift and must ascribe to him the glory of it. Whoever are in favor, it is God that has brought them into favor, and it is by him that they find good understanding. The Lord gave them wisdom and insight and knowledge and so on. We also see God's blessing. There at the end of the time, at the end of those three years, when Daniel and his friends are brought in before Nebuchadnezzar, the moment of truth, interviewed by the king himself, who we will see in chapter 2 is no slouch when it comes to matters of wisdom and insight. Indeed, the Hebrew language, the Hebrew that's used here implies an intensive interrogation. And what did he find? He found that they were ten times better. Now perhaps this is hyperbole meant to say that they were head and shoulders above the rest. But the point is clear that God does not desert those who cling to his word. And indeed, the Lord preserves Daniel 
all the way through the exile. For look how our chapter ends. Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. It's not just during the time of Nebuchadnezzar. He makes it through the successive kings all the way to a new, another king and another kingdom to Cyrus. The first year of Cyrus is a reminder of what's coming. God's faithfulness, not just in the exile, but through the exile and out of the exile. You see, in this first chapter, then we cover the entirety of the exile, all 70 years of it. And the Lord was with Daniel through them all. For it is there in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among, all, among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. That's the end of 2 Chronicles 36, verses 22 and 23. But the point is clear. Daniel is there until the end of the exile. He hears the proclamation, even as he saw the destruction of Jerusalem. So now he hears the promise of the temple being rebuilt. As we step back then and think about our chapter, I want to tie it together this way. The description of Daniel as a young man of good appearance, who was forcibly taken into exile, given a foreign name, to whom God gave favor and compassion, to whom God gave insight into visions and dreams, and who became ruler of Babylon, evokes the story that we hear elsewhere in Scripture, all the way back in the book of Genesis. For it reminds us of Joseph, who was also described as a young man, handsome, who was forcibly taken into exile in Egypt, given a foreign name, found favor in the sight of his master, to whom God gave the ability to interpret dreams, and who became ruler of Egypt. Indeed, this book then portrays Daniel as another Joseph, a child of God whom God will use to advance the cause of his kingdom, even in a foreign land. The life of Joseph and the life of Daniel, as well as all of his friends, remind us of God's care for his people wherever they may find themselves. No wonder the New Testament holds so closely to the exile nature of this present life. It is not meant to make us feel sort of bad about our situation, but to give us hope. For what a help such a comparison is. For it teaches us to hold this world rightly. Never too close, but also not far off. We are not of the world, but we are in it. We are in it so that our faith can grow and we can be tested or proved by our God. Yet I cannot help but see the further comparison that the scriptures demand when it comes to Joseph and Daniel. Both seem to be at the hands of their enemies and both are given blessing upon blessing. Both go through an experience akin to death and are raised to prominence and what can be best described as a new life. In other words, they set the pattern and the precedent for death and resurrection. Joseph and Daniel then point forward, for we know that they both died and remained dead. Joseph's bones were preserved and taken from Egypt to the promised land. Daniel would die in the first year of Cyrus. He would hear the proclamation to rebuild the temple, and yet even that would not be the ultimate fulfillment of God's promises. When we turn to the Gospel of Matthew, we find the genealogy that meets us at the beginning of the New Testament. And it begins there with Abraham and goes all the way down through the exile to Jesus Christ. You see, beloved, the New Testament puts Christ in this story to make us understand clearly that he is the fulfillment of it. He is the telos. He is the direction it has always been going. For he too would be handed over to his enemies, Satan, sin, and death. He would be crucified, dead, and buried. It would appear that God was nowhere to be found. And yet, he was with him. 
For Daniel's ascent and exile and Jesus' ascension from the grave both prove that God is always in control, for death could not hold him. While the world and Satan threaten with death, God's power rests not in his ability to cause death, but in his ability to undo death. For Daniel, as good as dead, is made new again in Babylon. Jesus, left in the grave, is raised to new life. And we too, though we die, yet we shall live because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. This book reminds us then that our lives are not our own, for we have been bought with a price. Our God is with us. He guides us throughout our lives. This is our hope. This is our confession. And this is what calls us then to walk before our God faithfully, even as Daniel and his friends did.